Welcome to second semester. This is Biology 102, and this is Chapter 18 in your text, Biology 2E, Evolution and Origin of Species. So everything evolves, and basically the idea behind evolution, evolution simply means change over time, and everything changes over time. So everything is evolving and everything is constantly evolving. And so all living organisms, including humans, are changing over time. Now those changes can occur at the level of an individual, at the level of the species, or at the level of a population, and they can remain invisible. In other words, you can have a, a change evolve in the genome of an organism that never manifests itself or you can have a change that evolves in the genome that manifests itself in the phenotype and so what as we get here started in here into chapter 18 we're going to be looking at the idea of evolution and where it comes from and uh, that's going to lead us into evolution of individuals and then species and populations in chapter 19. So our objectives for this chapter is to define evolution, define adaptation and give examples, explain convergent and divergent evolution, describe homologous and vestigial structures and give examples, define species and describe how scientists identify species, Describe variables that lead to speciation. Identify prezygotic and postzygotic reproductive barriers. Explain allopatric and sympatric speciation. And describe adaptive radiation. So here's your evolution primer. Evolution means change over time, as I've said. Now, living organisms are constantly evolving in response to their changing environment. The process of species evolution has been a subject of interest in study for centuries, and you are familiar with the name Charles Darwin from the 19th century, and his um, friend and sort of partner in crime, if you will, Alfred Russell Wallace. Now, they independently describe species evolution by means of natural selection, and they would eventually come together and uh, combine their research and present papers on evolution by means of natural selection. Natural selection then is propagation of favorable traits which impart fitness on an individual and certainly by extension to species and population. Now natural selection is selection of specific traits, favorable traits that will impart fitness on an individual or species. Now what is fitness? Fitness in the natural world is the ability to survive and reproduce in a particular environment. Okay, so the whole bottom line between, between, behind evolution of organisms is to evolve traits that will allow an individual and by extension species and populations the ability to survive and reproduce. That's the key. Okay, so, so get this into your mind. As a basic biological organism, like elephants and like lions and tigers and bears, oh my, and like earthworms and like pine trees, okay? The only thing and this includes humans, but the only thing that we want to do as humans is basic biological organisms, just like any other, is to find food, which will give us energy to find a mate and reproduce. Okay? And as a basic biological organism, after you reproduce, after you uh, send your favorable genes into the next generation, nothing else matters. You can die after that and everything is just fine. Okay, that's basic biology. 
find food, to make energy, to find a mate, and to reproduce. Now, of course, as humans, I don't want to minimize humanity Humanity here. As humans, we do so much more because we're uh, intellectually, cognitively much higher developed than we go to school. We learn things and we get degrees and we get great jobs and we buy fancy cars and we build new homes and, you know, we travel to fascinating places and all that, okay? But as a basic biological organism, your job is to find food, to make energy, to find a mate, to reproduce. And, that, and if you've done that, then you've been a successful organism, a successful individual in your particular species. So the idea behind evolution by means of natural selection was developed independently by Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace, but eventually they would come together and combine their ideas. And by the way, this was in the 19th century. So this was in the uh, mid um, 1800s. Okay, so here's a quick check for you. Evolution by means of natural selection was described by whom? And your choices are Darwin, Wallace, Plato, and Hutton. I'll let you think about it. Um, you'll recall from your reading, if you've read chapter 18, that Plato was a um, philosopher in ancient times. And his idea was that species are static and unchanging. So obviously, uh, he would not have described evolution. Hutton was a geologist, um, Swedish, I think, but his premise was that geological changes occur gradually and over long periods of time. So you just don't have a mountain range form overnight. It forms over geologic, we say geologic time, we mean eons even, uh, but long periods of time and very gradually. And in fact, Darwin considered Hutton's um, ideas about geological changes, gradual changes over long periods of time as he developed his ideas about evolution, um, sort of combining the two trains of thought, and he came up with the with the idea that evolution of species does not does not occur all at once at a moment's notice in the blink of an eye. It occurs gradually over time. And that's where his ideas of natural selection and things happening over millions even of years, that's where that comes from. So your answers here are Darwin and Wallace, right? Because they worked independently, but eventually together to develop their uh, theory of evolution by means of natural selection. All right. So the Galapagos finches, sometimes in your reading you'll see Darwin's finches, but these are the uh, collection of birds, are species, multiple species of birds that live in the Galapagos Islands. Galapagos finches are an example of evolution in action. Now, Darwin recognized this in the 1830s, right, when he was on the Beagle and he was the naturalist there and he went there and he looked at all these different creatures, tortoises and iguanas and lots of plants and these uh, small birds called finches and in fact the study of the Galapagos finches continues. Now what you see here are the seed-eating finches. There's a bunch of different kinds of finches. Some eat insects and some eat plant material and some eat seeds and there are a number of finches that eat seeds. And what Darwin noticed is that um, birds with large broad beaks are able to crack open large thick-shelled seeds while birds with 
these thin, very narrow beaks are able to crack open only the little tiny thin-shelled seeds. And then you have a series of birds kind of in the middle that sort of feed, um, you know, back and forth between them or that can crack open and feed on medium-sized seeds. Now, what I said, the, the observation of the finches continues to this day. There, um, Peter and Rosemary um, Green, Grant, I'm sorry, their last name was Grant, began in the 1970s studying the Galapagos finches, even as Darwin had done, and their research actually continues to this day. Even to this day in the 21st century, the research that they started, um, students are sent to the Galapagos Islands to look at these finches and measure and study their beaks for the seed-eating finches um, as just a continuous process of observation and experimentation looking at these finches. Now these are the seed eating finches and, and that's why we have these photographs here, these drawings from Darwin's day and these photographs from modern day of the same types of finches. And, and what they found was, uh, what the Grants and their compatriots have found over the years is that when the um, climate on the islands is dry, not a lot of moisture, then plants, the plants that sow large hard-shelled seeds prevail and as a result the finches with these large broad beaks prevail and more of them are able to survive and reproduce. They are more fit for that particular environment. However, when, uh, for instance, an El Nino blows in, then the Galapagos Islands gets a lot of rain, lots of moisture, and as a result, the plants that sow the big, large, thick seeds tend to back off, and the plants that sow the little, the, the small, uh, thin shelled seeds prevail and so as a result you see more of the finches with the little tiny thin narrow beaks and then as the climate changes then you get more and more of the intermediate sized beaked birds okay so when it's really dry you get more of the birds and more of the finches with the large thick bills when things are really, really wet, you get more finches with the little thin bills. So it's a, it's a trade-off as the environment changes, you see more and more of one species over another. It's quite interesting, and some, I forget the, the author wrote a book about the Grant's work in the Galapagos Islands with the finches. It's called Darwin, the book is called Darwin's Finches. And uh, I read it years ago, but it's really, really fascinating. And um, if you're interested, it's called Darwin's Finches, and the work is still going on. Okay, so natural selection can occur only if there is variation within, the pop within a population. If there's no variation, if, every if everything is the same, if everybody is the same size, if nothing ever changes, then there's nothing for nature to select. There's nothing for natural selection to pick and choose from. Variation then are genetic differences between individuals in a population. One individual was bigger and stronger. Another individual was um, small and skinny and able to squeeze through small tunnels. Um, one individual has a large thick beak. One individual has a little narrow thin beak, okay? These genetic differences manifest as phenotypic differences. These are differences in the appearance of the physical characteristics of an organism, like the beaks of the Galapagos finches. Now, variation, genetic differences between individuals, this is genetic diversity, is a result of mutation or sexual reproduction. 
So you know these terms already. Mutation is a change in the genotype. Remember, that's the DNA that eventually makes protein. But you get a change in the genotype. We call that a mutation. And mutations can be beneficial. They can be detrimental. Or they can be neutral, not making one difference one way or the other. Um, I'll, um, an example here may be, for instance, the sickle cell trait, right, is beneficial in those areas where malaria is prevalent because it protects a person against malaria. But it's detrimental in areas where, or sickle cell disease is detrimental in areas where um, there is no chance of catching malaria and you got two parents um, that produce a an offspring with two copies of that recessive gene and then you have a problem or they can be neutral now uh, mutations often yield visible changes in the phenotype like Galapagos like the beaks of the Galapagos finches and variation can also occur through sexual reproduction, and you learn this in um, Biology 101 through crossing over and independent assortment. Now, variation yields adaptation, and so what is an adaptation? It's any heritable, that's a, that means a genetic trait that increases an individual's fitness in a given environment. So you're able to you're an organism, an organism that's able to gather more food in a particular environment than um, another individual of the same species over here. Okay, if you're better able to gather food than your neighbor is, then natural selection will select for your your better ability to collect food because remember natural selection produces fitness and weeds out unfit individuals so if you can if you can collect if you have a better way to collect food then that's a that's a positive trait that's a fit trait over someone who can't collect food as well or if your size is an advantage in your particular environment Natural selection will select for your the genes that produce your size. Um, if you're able, if you're a plant and you're able to grow taller in uh, a heavily forested area, which means that you can collect more light, better able for you to survive and reproduce, then natural selection will choose you over your neighbor who has a problem getting so tall okay so anything if you're a if you're a if you're a bullfrog and your call is loud and deep and you're better able to attract mates then natural selection will choose you over the little guy over here who has a little whiny you know call <laughs> bullfrog it has a, a, a little a low call and it's not as loud not as strong natural selection will choose you because you're you're better able to attract mates and therefore better able to reproduce you're more fit than someone else okay all of these kinds of phenotypic advantages come through genetic changes or genetic mutations genetic adaptations really should be would be a better term there okay so we have a couple of different patterns of evolution convergent evolutions where similar traits evolve independently in distantly related species and I've shown you wings of bees here or wings and the ability to fly in bees and bats you have an insect here you have a mammal here um, very different organism not closely related at all um, but you have both wings and the ability to fly evolving in both of them. That's convergent evolution. So that's the evolution of similar traits 
similar phenotypes or similar um, abilities by way of flying evolving from very different organisms to a common to a common point that's convert they converge common points so you have bees which are very different from bats but they've evolved convergently to both acquire wings and the ability to fly we have divergent evolution these are different traits that evolve in closely related species so here we see uh, two flowering plants these are angiosperms and all flowering plants are very closely related but you can see the difference here in phenotype between the um, the shape of the flower the color of the petals you see these are those torches I always call them torches but uh, these individual things are seeds and with a sunflower all you know what a sunflower seed looks like so these are angiosperms very closely related flowering plants but you can see they have diverged from a common ancestor to deliver or to produce very different colors and petal shapes and seeds. So here's another quick check for you. Insect wings and bat wings are an example of, think about it, and your choices are convergent evolution or divergent evolution. So I want you to remember that convergent evolution is where you have two different organisms, one over here, one over here, not closely related at all, but they're going to evolve something that is very similar between the two. So you have evolution of something that is similar between the two very different organisms. That's convergent evolution versus divergent evolution, which is the exact opposite, where you have organisms with, with our, which are very closely related evolving structures um, abilities behaviors that are very different from one another and so we've already learned that insect wings and bat wings and indeed the ability to fly are both examples are examples of of course convergent evolution so evidence for evolution you just have you should just have a general idea of what's going on here in archaeology the fossil record is laden with evidence for evolution so we have archaeological or fossil evidence for evolution you can see this whole line of skulls this is the modern human here and it goes back way back um, we'll, we'll talk more about the details of some of these structural or fossil evidential things in a later chapter there is anatomical evidence these are called homologous structures or evidence of evolution so here we see a human arm a dog leg a bird wing and a whale flipper and so we're looking for structures that are homologous that are homologs that are the same between very different organisms and you can see the structure of the limb by color is the exact same between all of these different organisms you have a single bone here uh, in this case the upper arm and the forearm or lower arm you have a, a pair of bones and then you have a series of small bones in the wrist and then the bones of the fingers here in the dog we have this single bone and the forelimb we have this double bone same pattern the series of small bones and the bones of the toes here in the bird wing same pattern one bone there two bones here a series of bones in the wrist and then the bones the, the bones of the fingers if you will and in the whale single bone here double bone in the forelimb a series of small bones in the wrist and then the finger bones all right, so this tells you that all of these organisms have evolved from a, from a common ancestor 
and these homologous structures have been retained. Okay, so that, that's an ancient um, evolutionary feature between these. That's how we know that these organisms are related at some point in geologic time. So that's the anatomical uh, evidence. Here's embryological evidence. Now, you look at it, here's, here's very different organisms, fish, here's a bird, a reptile, here's a snake, this is a turtle by the way, here's a snake, tortoise, uh, a mammal, and another mammal, which is a human. Now, at this stage in time, okay, here, maybe not so much, but l look at the mouse and the mammal. Very similar in structure here. And in fact, if you kind of look at these, just look at them just generally across the board, there's not a whole lot of differentiation between the two. So we can study embryology, and we can see that in the mammalian kingdom, up to certain points in development, there's very little difference between them. Now here, okay, maybe you can see, you can tell, you know, this is not a human. But what if you look at um, here, okay, here, um, this is an illustration showing you similarities in embryological structure. Now these are gill cells. Here's the lamprey. That's going to be a jawless fish. Here, these are going to develop into gills. Okay, so but here's a turtle. We have, in a turtle, you have gill slits develop, call them gill slits, develop, or pharyngeal slits in the neck, that develop in the embryo of the turtle. At some point in embryological development, you get gill slits developing here in the chicken, in the domestic cat, and in the human. So across the board, all of these vertebrates at some point in development have gill slits. And in some organisms, they will become gills, as in fishes, and in others, they will become various structures. We call them pharyngeal slits because they will become various structures um, in the neck around the pharynx. Okay, but at this point, you know, gill slits or pharyngeal slits. Now, now that that is not saying anything about humans developing from fish. Okay, that's not what that is saying. It's just that at some point in a distant geologic or evolutionary past, all of these organisms have stemmed from some common ancestor. And that's what evolution is all about. I love to show this when I teach this class live. I show my my graduate um, research was in frogs, frog genetics. and But I always love showing this picture in to my students in uh, live class because these um, are all developing embryos for a frog. This is what f developing embryos in a frog looks like. But here's the zygote, right? This is a sperm fertilized egg. And then it's one cell divides into two. You know this already. Two cells divide into four. We call this the cleavage, this process cleavage. Four divides into eight, into 16. And up through this point now here are the neural neural plate developed, neural fold developed. Up through these early stages, you cannot tell, except for size, but you cannot tell structurally a frog embryo from a human embryo, from an elephant embryo, from um, a fish embryo, okay? Everything, everybody looks the same except for size from our perspective. If you're an embryologist, of course, there are going to be other things that you can look for or that you will look for to differentiate them. But up through a number of these stages, you can't tell a human from a frog, from a pig, from a giraffe. That tells you that the 
development, uh, the embryological development, is a very old process that has evolved a very little over the course of geologic and evolutionary time. We have retained that process for many, many millions of years. And in fact, when, when I teach this lab live, we don't look at when we're studying these stages of development, we don't look at human embryos. We look at starfish embryos. We look at sea urchin embryos. Uh, we look at zebrafish embryos because at these early stages, everything looks the same. Quite interesting. And then from molecular biology, we have the idea of the central dogma. Now you learn this in 101, central dogma. You know that DNA is transcribed into RNA and RNA is translated into protein. And that process is across the board, whether you're a pine tree or an elephant or a human or a rattlesnake or whatever, okay? An amoeba, that process remains. That process, the process is the same. It, it, has, it has not evolved or not changed over millions and millions and millions of geologic and evolutionary years, okay? So that's a process that has been retained, and so that, and so that, what that tells you is that we are all, all of life is related at some point back, way back in geologic and evolutionary time, because this process is the same in all of us in the 21st century. Okay, so let's go to the video now. This video, um, it's from Useful Charts. I love it. It's really good. It's a little bit long. It's almost 18 minutes. Um, it's worth your while to watch the video. It's called Evolution and Classification of Life, and it goes through the tree of life, if you will, um, describing the relationships between, for instance, bacteria and archaea and protists and plants, and in plants, the relationship between um, seedless plants and seeded plants and pine trees and rose bushes and on the animal side relationships between uh, amoeba and earthworms and rattlesnakes and turtles and mammals including elephants and lions and human okay goes through all of that it's worth watching um, you might want to do it if you get a chance at home to watch that video but really really good so speciation is a formation of new species, in other words, a formation of two species from one original or parental species or founding species. Species is a group of organisms which can interbreed and produce viable and fertile offspring. An example here is Homo sapiens or humans, but the key here with a species is viable, that's alive, and fertile that's the ability to reproduce offspring because there are some species that can mate but their offspring are non-fertile. Generally different species that may mate will produce non-living offspring because differences in chromosomes and that kind of thing. So members of the same species have both internal and external characteristics that make them compatible. In other words, they have similar DNA. And um, a hybrid is a cross between different but genetically similar species. Genetically similar, which means that they can survive. They'll, they'll remain alive, but generally they are sterile. They cannot reproduce. So, this, uh, it, so if you have two different species that are able to reproduce and deliver a viable offspring, but that offspring is sterile, then that is not a separate species, okay? That's a hybrid. That's what we call a hybrid. So the best example, I think the most common example, is the horse and the donkey. 
mating to create a mule. Now, uh, it's for to make a mule, you have to cross a female. By the way, this is a symbol for female. The symbol with a little arrow is a, the symbol for male. That is something that you definitely should know. But you take a female horse, you mate it with a male donkey, and you get a mule. And a mule is always male. And a mule is sterile, cannot reproduce. Now, it can go the other way. You can have a uh, male horse and a female donkey. And what you end up with is a henny, H-I-N-N-Y, a henny. That's um, a female hybrid from a horse and a donkey, also uh, sterile. Okay, but the, the mule, we don't, you don't usually hear about a henny, but we often hear about mules. And um, so there you go. Mules are sterile, by the way. So mules are hybrids of horses and donkeys. All right, so let's go to the video, Why Hybrid Animals May Take Over the North from Real Science. Really kind of a cool video. Um, I'm not saying that I want you to glean anything from the video. It's just really interesting, interesting perspective. Okay, something for you to watch. Uh, it's, it's entertaining. All right, now speciation uh, continued. We have allopatric speciation. Now allopatric means widely um, means other land widely translated is what I was trying to think of allo means different Patrick has to do with land so the geographic separation of a population from its parent species geographic separation so there has to be land or a big body of water where where on one side you have a species on the other side, you have a species. They both evolved from a parental species, a common ancestor. But now because of this gulf between them, this distance between them, a mountain range or whatever, uh, they can no longer interbreed. And so here we see the spot. Here we see Mexican spotted owl. And here we see another spotted owl in the U.S. Northwest. And because of this gulf between them, right, these guys inhabit this area, these guys inhabit this area, ne'er the two shall meet. This, this area is too far for them to fly to meet each other, so they'll never, they can never reproduce. But yet genetically, they're similar enough to have evolved from um, the same parental species okay but they live in different geographic locations that's allopatric speciation here's another example with these two different squirrels they're genetically similar so that we know that they've evolved from a from a similar uh, from the same parental species but now because of this great gulf called the Grand Canyon you have one species living on one side, the other species living on the other, and of course you're familiar with the Grand Canyon, ne'er the two shall meet, so they can never never reproduce. So you have two species that have evolved from a common ancestor separated by this gulf called the Grand Canyon. That's allopatric speciation. Now we have adaptive radiation is a type of allopatric speciation where one Founder species evolves into several other others based on adapt adaptation to unique niches or habitats. And the example that your book gives is the Hawaiian honey creeper. Here we see that diagram from your text. Here's the parental species developing into different types of honey species based on various habitats or various mm, food items. And then the Galapagos finches certainly is an example of adaptive radiation. They've all come from um, a common parental species on the mainland, and they have evolved to eat insects and live in trees and live on the ground and live in cacti and eat fruit and flowers and seeds. Here are those seed eaters over here. 
the ground finches that eat seeds that Darwin was examining and that the Grants continued to examine. And then we have Sympatric. So there's Allopatric where they live in different geological locations and our geographical locations and here's sympatric sim means the same so same land formation of new species from a common parent but occurs in the same geographical location here's an example of these cichlid fishes so you have these fishes are separated uh, they live in the same body of water so the same geographical location but in this case, you have this fish that lives in the upper layers of water where it gets more sun. We call that the limnic zone. And here you have a fish that lives in the benthic zone, which is way down near the substrate. It gets very little light. And because these two cichlid species um, have evolved to inhabit those various niches or you some people say niches they'll never meet they don't meet to reproduce okay this one likes light this one does pretty well with very low light and so there's no reason for this guy to come up no reason for this guy to go down all right but they're in the same body of water same geographical location that's sympatric speciation Here's another example which um, maybe you can relate to more. This is the Hawaiian, uh, the hawthorn fly, also known as the apple maggot fly, because it lays its eggs in apples. Of course, the eggs from flies evolve into um, evolve into metamorph into maggots and they eat the fruit now this we call the hawthorn fly because initially it started out laying its eggs in hawthorn berries so there's a hawthorn tree hawthorn berries and at some point in time one fly landed on an apple laid its eggs and now its offspring um, evolved to prefer apples over hawthorn berries so what happens is I'm not sure which way it goes but what happens is it's I think it's the male maggots when they turn into flies they return to apples to find mates and the female maggots in the hawthorn berries when they evolve into flies they return to lay their eggs on hawthorn berries All right i think that if i remember correctly that's the way it works but the point here is you have this fly that has evolved um two different two different species from a single parental species to prefer two different berry trees now They've, they've evolved so the hawthorn flies and the apple maggot flies have evolved from the same parental species and they occur in this they can occur in the same geographical location so in your backyard you could have a hawthorn tree and an apple tree and those flies will not cross breed so same geographical location that's sympatric speciation okay uh, th this also occurs in plants here's allopatric speciation where you have the American dogwood cornus Florida and the Chinese dogwood cornus Cusa obviously evolving um, same kind of plant evolving in two different geographical locations one in China one in North America uh, but of course now you can buy Chinese dogwoods as an ornamental plant to put in your backyard alongside of your American dogwood. And here's another example of mountain roses. This is on an island in Australia where you have the same plant evolving in the same geographical location. Uh, you can, 
I, you can look at this a little bit closer and you can see you have um, sympatric speciation and allopatric speciation occurring in both species all over the island, right? Same geographical location. All right, so we have another quick check here. Galapagos finches, I'm talking about the seed-eating finches that the grants have studied are an example of and your choices are allopatric speciation or sympatric speciation. Now, this is not a trick question. It's just to make you think. Allopatric speciation, right, is speciation um, based on different geographical locations. That's certainly not the case here. Sympatric speciation, speciation within the same geographical location. But remember what's going on here. These finches, as the weather changes, as the climate changes from year to year or a season to season or decade to decade, you get different um, numbers of large build finches versus small narrow build finches all right these are they're not different species they just have different phenotypic variations and so as the weather changes and you get more large build finches or in the wet weather you get more narrow narrow build finches you don't actually see different species so, so otherwise you'd have like a million different species right it's the same species it just changes in number so again it's not a trick question I just wanted you to think about it it's not speciation at all it's just evolution by means of natural selection okay which can occur without speciation occurring all right so the final video here is the evolution by natural selection Darwin's finches by few school and it's a really quick little video, a um, couple minutes, minute 30, something like that, to give you an idea of evolution by means of natural selection. The example here, is, of course, is Darwin's finches. It's a little animation. Preguntas, if you have any questions, contact me, um, message, email, use the inbox. See you in Chapter 19.